Test, test, test. Okay, okay. Hello, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael 
Markowski, and we're going to be making a painting together today, and we are going to be making a painting by another one of my favorite artists. Of course, these are all my favorite artists. Uh, the artist we're going to be looking at is Belt Morisot, um, or maybe Bertha, or Berth, Berth Morisot, depending on <laughs> where how you want to pronounce it. Uh, she uh, was a French artist, and arguably the most famous female artist in history. Um, maybe not as well known today as she should be, but certainly, you know, while she was alive, she was, well, especially in France, she was very well known. And uh, subsequently, after she died, gained more and more and more fame. She still regularly makes the top five list of the most expensive or as having produced some of the most expensive paintings by women ever. Um, let's just, while I'm on the topic, oops, my mouse is upside down here. Um, so here's the 10 most expensive women artists at auction. It kind of sounds like they're auctioning off women as opposed to their paintings. Um, Giorgio O'Keefe, Louise Bourgeois, there's one of these giant uh, um, spider sculptures in the National Gal or outside the National Gallery in Ottawa. Louise, uh, sorry, this is Joan Mitchell, abstract painter. And then here we have uh, Berthe Morisot, um, the f number four. And so she's kind of been up at the top a few times and then kind of, you know, as, you know I'm sure by the time another year from now she'll be number one or two three five so this is i think these numbers are from 2018 or something so uh but as i said consistently ranking amongst the the most expensive paintings um by anybody but by in terms of women um, you know the top five four of all time um and since that's you know one way that people judge the value of things it's worth a mention Although sometimes I don't know how a painting could possibly be worth so much money. Um, but hey, if you got the money and you want to spend it, <laughs> go right ahead. Um, so other notable things is she was one of the first women to also exhibit in the salons in Paris. So 150 years ago, the real... And I, I think I've, we've talked about this when we talked about Mary Cassatt, her, um, one of her contemporaries, another Impressionist painter who happened to be a woman. Um, Mary Cassatt, though, was American. Um, but uh, one of the only places for artists to exhibit their work and for it to be seen by a wide group of people would be to be exhibiting in the salons. Right? Let me see if I hover over. You can see an image of the salons where there's just like packed full of art all the way up to the ceilings, literally sometimes on the ceilings. And uh, artists would submit their work and there would be a jury that would either accept you or not accept you. And so she was one of the first women that was actually exhibited in there. Her first painting was accepted when she was, I think, 23. So, which is, you know, that's back in the day, being young and exhibiting your work at that age was also very rare. Usually you'd have to wait until you're in your 40s or 50s before you would be accepted into this boys club, right? But she made it in when she was quite young, um, before even Claude Monet, uh, the sort of what people would consider as like the grandfather or the Impressionist painter, really. Um, I'm not going to go through her entire life here, but, you know, like a lot of women at the time, and really honestly up until very recently, she you know, the opportunities for women were quite limited, so she wasn't really able to go for a formal training. She had some kind of schooling, you know, because that was one of the things that good ladies did, is they would take a watercolor class, and uh, that was part, you know, and they would learn how to set a table and, and do all these entertaining things. Um, but it was never intended for women to take this seriously. It was just sort of like a hobby to, to keep you busy while your husband's at work kind of thing. Um, but uh, she was pretty determined, like, no, I'm into this, and this is what I want to do with my life. And that, of course, made things quite difficult for her. She became friends with some of the most famous painters at the time. 
Um, and some of the most famous artists that we know today, like uh, Camille Corot, and there's a mention here about Manet. I'm sure we'll see it here. But um, Corot was one of her early teachers. He's a, a very famous French painter at the time. Let's just see. Let's go right to her paintings here. Um, here's a, this is a painting. Or here's a couple of images of her. This is by by her friend Edouard Manet, possibly a more than a friend <laughs> of hers at certain points in time. Um, this is another portrait of her that Manet painted. Edouard Manet is is you know one of the most famous artists of all time. And she was good friends with him, and she she certainly would have learned a lot from him again because she wasn't able to go to the academies like he would have been. Um, but uh, she eventually married his brother, and there's some speculation, as I was hint alluding to, that maybe she was intimate with Edouard, and then his brother afterwards. They had uh, I think a couple, or they had one child, Julie here. So she obviously also posed for a lot of other artists. She was a very beautiful woman, besides being a very talented artist herself. Let's just kind of go down. There's some paintings at the very bottom here. So we'll just take a quick look at some of her art. Um, again, like um, Mary Cassa, the opportunities for her to paint in, were kind of limited. Like, So she was kind of stuck around her house painting more domestic scenes whereas the guys got to go and you know go paint uh you know uh wolf hunts and duck hunts or not yeah wolf hunts fox hunts um and uh go to the make like her a friend of hers Degas paint um horse races those kind of things a lot of that stuff was off limits to women at the time so understandably she's making paintings of inside her house, around her house, her child, other people's children, other women that would uh, visit with her, uh, wives uh, and mistresses of some of her male colleagues. And um, so here's a bunch of paintings of her. You can see how many other artists made paintings of her, including Renoir, Manet a bunch of times here. Um, and... Yeah, let me see if there's anything else I want to mention here while we get going. Just a few more if we just look at images of hers on the web. Again, we'll see a number of, of paintings of her, not by her, when we Google her name, which is uh, kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so maybe some... Let me see if there's... Do I have a link open in terms of... Well, I guess one thing we'll just sort of look at right before we begin our painting is one of the main features of impressionist paintings is a the whole idea of impressionism is you know if you really if you break it down as most simple as possible the idea of creating an impression right and you know like and if you think about the expression people says you know I get the impression that you're not happy with me, right? It's sort of like, I'm not sure, but I think you're not happy with me. And if you think about that in relationship to, to how impressionism is, it's about like a, you're giving, you're giving somebody the fleeting feeling of something, not the, not the distinct, hard, mathematical, factual version of it. Right, it's sort of like the a, a fleeting glimpse of something. You know, it's like the you're walking down the street and you see somebody walks by on the opposite side of the street and you're like, "Wait a second, Did that it looks like why is that person so familiar?" I feel like oh, it was like maybe somebody I went to school with or so that's I if I could best describe the experience of impressionism, it's that kind of a feeling of like. This almost somewhat uncanny experience of having seen or experienced the, the 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 what you're seeing in a painting, but obviously you weren't there looking over their shoulder. So there's this familiarity, unfamiliarity, um, or uh, the Heimlich and Umheimlich uh, 
as uh, as Freud would would say. Um, but uh, the so this idea of creating, uh, like for instance, if we even just we can just kind of randomly look at some of her paintings, like this one. If, okay, so here's an image of two women picking some kind of fruit off a tree, and it's not quite clear who these women are. Like we, it's you know if like uh, are they is it, maybe is one of them a friend um is it uh somebody that works for them like their 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 facial features are not super distinct and that's a you'll see like here's another example right here so let's see if i can open this up because here's a nice big picture um come on all these pop-ups so if you look at this image oh it's not gonna as I zoom in, it gets smaller. Okay. Uh, but you can see here, like, this portrait of this woman. I'm not sure what this painting is called, but it is by her. The features, this could be a lot of different people. And I think that's another one of the attractions to Impressionism is you look at it and you can kind of put yourself into the person in the picture or you could imagine them being a friend of yours. Like, oh, it kind of looks like my friend mary or sue or barbara or whatever right like there's a that ambiguity i think is really important and when you think of that ambiguity when we start making our painting and a big part of it is the looseness of the brush strokes there's it's it's sort of the exact opposite of um of like keith herring for instance where we have literal black sharp lines Although you might also say that those characters are intended to be universal too. So coming at maybe the same idea, but in the two diametrically opposed strategies, right? Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, this is the painting that we are going to make today. So it's called Roses from 1894. So a hundred and what, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. This painting was made. Now, let's just take a second to examine this painting and start to come up with a plan to, to make this painting. So we can try and figure out how this painting was made um, because I'm not exactly sure myself, but there are clues in this painting and let's figure it out together. Okay, so the first thing we can start looking at is the, the looseness of the, these brush strokes that I mentioned, right? We see more so than like when we painted the Mirandi uh, vase of flowers. The, you know, there was a pretty distinct difference. In fact, let's get out the old stack of paintings here. <laughs> um, where was our Mirandi here? I need a file. I think we all need a filing system for our paintings now. So let's take a look at these two paintings. So this is the Giorgio Morandi painting we made about a month ago, right? And you can see that there's much more structure in this picture. We have some definite outlining of shapes. We can see a distinct difference between the image in the foreground and then the background, right? There's, we can sense that there's like this thing in front of this thing, right? There's, there's, there's layers in the painting. Whereas in the painting on our left, Roses by Morisot, there is, it's much more blurry, right? I mean, that's one of the things people often will say about a impressionist painting. It almost looks like a slightly out of focus photograph. And yes, of course, there is, you know, this brown as a background, but you could also feel like it sort of invades into the objects in the foreground. Like it seems to kind of seep into it and like this flower simultaneously sort of like, like it's kind of like, where is the edge of this flower? It's kind of, there's a brush stroke here, but where does it begin and end? And that's a really important part of Impressionism is that 
confusion between objects in various different spaces. And they're sometimes doing that deliberately to create that kind of confusion and create a little bit of uncertainty in the painting, which would make people want to stop and look a little bit closer because they're just like, wait, what's going on here? Like what? And it's almost like one of those uh, 3D puzzles that you got to look at for a while to figure out what's going on. Anyway, so if we look, let's see if we can zoom in on this. I think the painting is going to fall apart a little bit in terms of pixelation, but we can see that there's a few different layers of paint in here. And exactly what the underpainting is, is I'm, I'm not entirely clear. But we'll, we'll talk about one of the, the she might have been, paint, she did painted this with oil paint. And then I would bet you she's using a combination of a dry brush technique, which we're going to explore today. And I think that would be the first time we'll do that. And, and also a kind of a wet technique, but a very wet technique in painting very thin layers and then possibly even wiping some of that away with a, with a cloth or a rag, right? So, um, I would say, and, and I think, so the other thing too is she probably created the underpainting all with one color. So previously what we've been doing is dividing the painting up into a foreground and background, putting a cool color in the background and a warm color in the foreground. Here, we can still do that. And um, I was even debating whether I might make two versions of this painting tonight. Um, I think I'll do one and then maybe depending on how much time we have, make a second one so you could kind of see that. But because of this one may take a little bit longer then it may first appear, not because it's that much more complex, but because we might have to wait a little bit for paint to dry. So let's get out our materials and get right to it. So I've got my palette, right? We'll, we'll see that in a second here. Um, just so I'm gonna need some rags. So here's some rags that I'm recycling that I've used many times. Right, so they're they're a little bit kind of uh, they're nearing the end of their life purpose, but I can still use them until they're just one hardened rock. We've got our paints, and again, like I say each time when I do this, why I I kind of set all this up while you're here is so that you can see how relatively you know, uh, little material is involved to make an artwork, right? There's, at, at the very most, a hundred dollars worth of art supplies in here. And this hundred dollars of art supplies, these paints, you know, uh, we're 23 episodes into this series. And I would say I've maybe used a quarter of this tube. So this is one of the 250 milliliter tubes, which cost about, I think, $12. So we could do another, what is that, another 100 paintings or so before we run out of paint. So in terms of a hobby, $100 that would could occupy you for maybe a year, try getting that out of, um, out of I mean, any, anything. <laughs> I can't think of any other hobby that, that is, you know, it sounds like a lot of money up front, but anyway. So also what I've done here is I've got a pre-gessoed canvas. So I bought one of these cheap canvases from the dollar store. This is literally one for a dollar. And then I applied some gesso over top of it, a, a white acrylic gesso or your sort of standard gesso as it would probably be called if you went into an art supply store. Obviously, it's important that it's acrylic and not oil-based because we're painting acrylics over top of it. And and I did want to just mention, too, I I've, I've keep forgetting to show this, but here you have two... This is often what I paint on, is small little panels like this. Literally, uh, these are birch... Um, I think these are birch panels, like a Luan kind of uh, for a door, right? Uh, they're very kind of thin wood 
I think this is like a sixteenth of an inch, and then I take it and get it uh, uh, using a table saw and chopped up. If you were found a really nice person working, well, actually there are some, uh, maybe not Home Depot, but if you went to a local lumber uh, store, you could probably get them to cut them into pieces like this for you. They, they would charge you for the cuts. You can also get things like this at art supply stores as well. But anyway, long story short is this one here, you can see what the original looked like. This has been coated with actually an oil-based gesso because I use these for painting with oil. So this is oil-based gesso and then I sanded it down. And then this here is using clear acrylic gesso over the same sort of material and then sanding it down. So you can see that it still has a bit of a ghosted quality. And you can see that the, the difference between here is the raw versus the sanded gessoed version. So that if anyone's interested in using clear acrylic gesso. Okay, so I've got my canvas here. Let's just give it a quick little rub with the... Uh, Okay, so just a quick little rub with the sandpaper. You can see there's a little bit of this on here. I'm going to rub it off onto my arm. Um, I just make sure we're... It's been been fully... Um, I, I used to, I, this is what I usually do with all my canvases. I rub them all over my body. So um, uh, my DNA is completely covered over the whole thing. So when there's any confusion... Hundreds of years of later, they'll know which one is which. Has it been rubbed on my body somewhere? Okay. <laughs> so, um, let's, uh, we're going to, now, I should also mention that we are not, this, the, the, this is a beginner's painting class, and I'm not going to show you necessarily exactly how she painted this painting. Um, I'm going to show you how to paint a version of this painting using the knowledge that we have in the from the previous 20 classes. So if there's somebody out there who's like, no, she would not have done this or that. It's like, okay, well, I'm not trying to um, show you exactly how she did it. She was acknowledged even by like Monet as being a virtuoso colorist, an incredible painter. There, I've read some few places talking about how she was considered sort of like the impressionist's impressionist, like like the best painter out of all of that group. So she is like a master, like there's there's no doubt about it. Um, so we're going to do our best to make a painting by one of the greatest artists in human history. <laughs> uh, so just so uh, because the other thing I want to mention, too, is she probably did not draw a lot of the impressionists were not drawing with a pencil onto the canvas first. Often what they would do is is literally use a brush and paint some of those first lines. Now, you if you want to maybe skip ahead in a couple minutes from where, where we are right now, you can do just that. I'm going to draw this out for the benefit of other people out there who might feel that painting directly onto the canvas in that way is a step a little bit too far okay so let's as as always i like to divide my canvas into half and it doesn't have to be perfect and all right so there's kind of the midway of this painting and here, let's take a look at the original here so that middle is somewhere right around in here right if we look at the middle of our painting and hers maybe let's just zoom in here okay so first thing is we've got we're just going to do let's say a big circle for this the main rows here somewhere here it's maybe a little bit off center Right, if you want to make it a little bit even further, again, you can change the composition entirely if you like. So we have this vase, and this vase is also a little bit off center. So I'm just going to start by kind of drawing this kind of a shape here. 
So it kind of looks like a, a Pez dispenser or something, right? So here's the beginning of our vase. And then let's put on either side, actually I'm going to kind of go right here, a little bump, a little hump right here. And let's put another one right here. Okay. So then if we were to continue this up, we have kind of nice smooth shape there. And then we can come down here and kind of just cut in a little bit here. Okay, and then we'll do another one of these little shapes here on the bottom. Okay. And then we're going to put a few more flowers in. So let's just say we'll put another flower in here. And then let's put another one up here. You know, they almost go kind of in a nice line, although it looks like this one is a little bit further down, right? So if they were to kind of, so they don't quite line up in a straight row, which I think is a good thing. I think if this other one did line up there, then it might, it might look too, like you want a little bit of randomness here in the painting, so. Um, what are other major things we could put in here? Let's say we've got a kind of a pedal here. We'll do a couple quick pedals. And then we've got this big leaf up here. I'm not even going to bother sketching out the inside of this because it'll just get covered with paint anyway. So then you can see this is going to be, it, we've got this big kind of mass of, of green and what it is is not fully distinct. So that's again part of the impressionist kind of style is a little bit of that ambiguity there, right? And then let's just put in a few leaves. Okay. You can also see it doesn't appear that there's like, you know, often in a lot of still lives, we might have like the, a wall or something like the edge of a table here, a horizon line. In this painting, there isn't one, right? It's sort of like this image to sort of not necessarily floating, because we're going to put a little shadow down here, but it does feel like um, a... Again, it's that ambiguity with the background. Like, the, the, there's no hard line showing us exactly where that background is. Okay, now before we start painting, I'm just going to take an eraser, and I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, just it'll make it easier so I don't have to worry about covering up any of these lines. Get rid of my... These uh, grid lines to begin with. And just going to erase a little bit. I'm going to erase these lines. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, okay. Like, I like kind of, I if I was just painting all by myself without filming this, what I would do is really erase a lot of it so that, because usually you don't necessarily want people to see this information. Now, there's plenty of artists who who are happy kind of showing their, their work. You know, kind of like uh, in, in math class when the teacher wanted you to show them the work, like how you arrived at your equations or whatever. But a lot of artists are very um, secretive and kind of hide this stuff. So we've got this basic image down here, our composition. All right, just another quick look at it before we start painting. Okay. Whew. So... Part of an impressionist painting is there's a, like a speed and a, and, a, and a immediacy, a movement to it, which might be different than some of the other types of painting we've done, which um, uh, are 
you know, let's say like, um, who would be a good example of somebody we, we looked at? Well, like Morandi, like a lot of the other artists we've, we've looked at, you know, everything is kind of a slow building together. Whereas Impressionism is a lot more like, like a 100 meter dash, right? There's like, there's a lot of like, like there's a lot of quick movement, right? You can almost imagine stand like that's I mean one of the reasons is like I'm standing on my feet like you're about to, like you're getting ready to go for a run here that's kind of how I feel about impressionist painting like they're trying to capture that moment that fleeting moment and the idea of trying to do it with a paintbrush that could take you a couple of hours to do seems a little bit antithetical so part of to to, to get that energy is in the, the speed and the immediacy of painting now that's hard when we're just learning how to paint because we don't know how to do it. So doing it, some, doing something we don't know very fast is just seems kind of illogical, right? So we'll, we'll do our best to try to capture the speed of the painting. Now, one of the common things that artists at this time would do would be to actually just put one color down on the background. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna kind of take a little bit of her um, style here. So I think we are going to need, we're going to need every color except black, right? Black is one of the colors we see almost never in Impressionist paintings, right? For, and w a reason we'll get into shortly here. So let's put some paint on our canvas um, or onto our palette, sorry. Again, I put about as much as I'd put, as much paint as I put on my toothbrush. Because some paint we're not going to use much of. And I don't know exactly off the top of my head which ones they'll be. So I don't want to needlessly waste paint. Um, if I can help it, right? Also because that paint will get, um, will start to dry up. And that's going to make our lives difficult trying to paint with dry paint or, or paint that is, you know, starting to, um, uh, get a little bit more tacky because it, it, it's, um, plasticizing. It's okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the comments. Irene, it says, I'm finally catching up and, and I'm back. Cool. So caught up to us. That's cool. That's cool. That's one of the benefits of doing this course is if you take a little bit of time off, you can just sort of binge watch a whole bunch of them to catch yourself up to where we are in real time. Okay. So let's look at her painting again. What we're going to do is we are going to try to get this warm brown. So often that would be the color that artists would put down as a bottom coat. And we're going to put that warm brown over the entire painting. So let's mix a warm brown. This is, is this a new brush? Let me see. Um, you know what? I'm going to use one of the larger brushes that I have in the set that I bought. Right? Again, these are all the brushes that you can get. I got all of these in this set from a couple different art supply stores, all in all for, I think, less than $20. Right, so you, you, whereas you could probably spend twenty dollars might be a down payment on one brush. You've probably seen a few of those and wondering why they're so expensive. Okay, so let's make a warm brown. So to get a warm brown, we're going to need mostly the warm yellow. We're going to need, so let's say if we had this is going to be about like sixty percent of our color. This is going to be about 30% of our color, the warm red. And the warm blue will constitute 5 to 10% of, of this brown, right? So, and then we'll mix... Uh, I don't think we'll... we'll we'll see. We'll see what the colors get. We may need a little bit of, of white in there, but I don't know. I don't think so. So, we're, let's take our... our warm yellow and right now I'm just getting some paint into these bristles 
I want the kind of nice the paint to be all inside of here. And then let's take a little bit of warm red. Alright, see all those darker colors are pretty dominant. Alright, so I'm adding a little bit of warm yellow into here. So right now we've got a warm orange, right? Halfway between here and here. And then we're going to add a little bit of this warm blue. In fact, that might have, you can see that that's might even be a little bit too much. So let's just wipe a bit off there. And then we can add, let's see, it might not have been too bad after all. Okay. So this color right here, this kind of color, we've got this brown. It's still a little bit um, more on the orangey side. Like this to me would be pretty good if I was going to try to paint like a, a redhead, a person with red hair. Um, this probably would be close to the color of their hair, right? Because we've got a lot of this very little blue. Um, so let's put a little bit more blue in here. You can see barely put any, like even less than last time. And let's go over this here. That's getting pretty good. I'm going to add just a little bit more. Again, you can see not much. Okay. There we go, it's much darker. And I think I'm just gonna use a bunch more of this paint now. I've just lightened it up with some of the yellow. Let's put a little bit more red in here. Okay. So I'm just massaging that color around so that it it really gets into all those fibers. Okay, now it is going to be a little bit lighter than this background. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see why I'm not painting super dark to begin with here. So I've got this paint on my brush. I'm even going to take some water and we're not going to use too much of it, but I'm just going to take some water, splash some drops into here. Okay, so this is going to, to lighten, or it's going to, it's what it's doing is thinning the paint, because what we're going to do is we're going to make a wash with this color. So let's say there's maybe like six, six or seven drops of white, or of water in there. Okay, now here's the fun part. We're going to cover this picture with this paint. And one of the, it's previously what we've done is maybe a more controlled kind of back and forth, like a computer printer. The impressionists, however, are doing this kind of thing. So this kind of paintbrush is going in a bunch of different, or, or paint, yeah, paint strokes um, going in different directions here. I'm also going to make sure I get my edges. If you know that I'm kind of, I like doing that. Okay, we're going to keep on going. So the part of the goal is not to obliterate all of these marks here. Is it's okay to leave some of the, the, the visibility of those those marks on the page here or the canvas. Like the impressionist unlike pretty much every art movement for thousands of years before them, we're all about sort of hiding the brush strokes. If you think of the Mona Lisa, part of the, the big, what makes that painting so incredible 
is that we don't really see any brush strokes on there whatsoever. It w it's like it was kind of, uh, it's divine, right? It just sort of appeared out of nowhere. Okay, so let's just take a look at, the, at these colors. So this right now obviously is a much lighter brown than, than the one we mixed. A few reasons why that happened is because we... Uh, we, we diluted it with we diluted this with some water right so that made it more transparent so that when we painted this brown which was it was already lighter than the original but when we when we diluted it and then painted it over top of this white background it's like we've added white paint to this color right so it's it's lightened up quite dramatically right but I, we're going to come back later on and use the same technique we just did to darken some of this later on. Okay, so we'll just kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. So, um, because as you saw in, let's go back here, in, there, there isn't just brown here. We've got green all in around in a different places. We've got a little bit more, looks like a bit of a pink or purple in some of these areas, like more green. Um, so we're going to, we're going to get there in, in, as we go forward. So this is going to take a couple seconds to dry. Now we painted it pretty thin so that it shouldn't take too long to dry. I bet you this will be dry within the next couple of minutes at, at the longest. And we don't need to wait in completely for it to dry but it will kind of make our lives a little bit easier so we don't get too much of this color mixing into the paint coming next i mean often what um artists would do is actually have like stacks of canvases like this already pre pre-primed like this with um some uh this warm background paint I'm getting this weird. Where's that reflection coming? Oh, I guess this is a shadow. Uh, okay. So, um, I thought I was losing things. In a... Okay, <laughs> I probably am, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, so let's just take a second here, clean our brushes, have a sip of tea. This is a new uh, Christmas chai tea. I'll think of I mean, I was just like, that is an interesting brand of tea. Okay. In the chat there, I asked people what your favorite kind of flower is. Donna says sunflower. Shelly says the simplicity of the daisy. Anna says daisies too. Donna likes daisies too. Maybe we should have done a daisy paint. I, um, Irene says, favorite flower is carnation, the flower of my birth month. Uh, hey, Shamsa, uh, she doesn't have a, a favorite flower, uh, or hydrangeas, hydrangeas? I've never, I don't think I've ever tried to say a hydrangeas out loud before. Um, no one said roses, <laughs> which is kind of funny to me. We're, we're sure painting. Oh, see, this is why I just like, you gotta just sometimes be more patient, Michael. <laughs> like, I, I just, I see a little drip there. I don't even know where that drip came from. I don't have my, I forgot my ice pack up there. So it was probably when I was washing my brushes, being a little bit uh, lazy and splashing water. So I've got this little speck. That's going to be covered with paint as we go forward. So I'm not even going to bother trying to fix it. But again, just a, if I had just left that there, it would have disappeared on its own and there wouldn't have been a problem. But um, I'm one of those persons that can be a little bit... You know, I see it, I want to fix it immediately, right? So here's another one down here. This, you can see the water is sort of trying to dissolve that paint. And that one I actually might fix just because um, it's, uh, it's, there's nothing that is going to be kind of hiding it. So I'm just going to come in here like that. Maybe while I'm right here. Oh, look at this. Making matters worse. That sounds like um, a sitcom that I should be on. Making matters worse. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, so almost done here. So while it's drying, I think what we'll do is we'll start mixing the next color, the greens that we're going to put on here. So clear a bit of room. And then let's look at this painting. So the green that we're going to use is we're going to go for a warm green because we want the the green we, we have this this background which is um, a, a warm red right so we're kind of setting ourselves up for a bit of a trick here or a problem potentially because if we've got a warm background then the colors on top that will certainly have to be warm and ideally warmer than the background right now I think when we as we go forward a little bit we will probably add a little bit of cool brown and cool green into the background just to very subtly push those colors backwards uh, and help create a little bit more space in this painting but as I said we'll get there in a second but we're gonna make a warm green so I'm currently out of warm yellow so and you know what I can just conserve a little bit of space here on my palette I'm just gonna clean some of this up you can see this is already dry here I don't I'm not usually too concerned about getting these colors mixing or the, you know I just um, in fact part of the impression of style is allowing the colors to mix a little bit but uh, just for our sake I think because who knows you know I, I, I want this to be as easily reproducible by everybody so if I start mixing my paints over top of a dirty area and then I get that pigment in there it's going to make my painting very specifically mine which is a good thing but since this is a instructional video that could be a little confusing uh, <laughs> Nia says making matters worse summarizes my whole life <laughs> Donna says making matters worse was my morning <laughs> yeah it's like um, okay so let's mix this uh, um, warm green here now let's actually it's probably worth just checking out our color wheel again because the warmest green that we can make is using warm yellow and warm blue but obviously that cuts right close to the neutral core and gets us to a very brown brownish green which I think there might be uh, let me see uh, I could see a little bit of that in some of these this area here but what I think is more likely is that she painted the warm yellow and the cool blue together so we still get a little bit of the pop in this cool blue but we still have warm yellow in there All right so Again, it's, this is a little bit tricky because we've got all of this warm background and we want it to pop forward. So we want as little amount of um, cool paint in there as possible. But I can see this area right in here is definitely a cool blue mixed in here. It's just that look of this like um, primary cyan kind of uh, resistant. Yeah, anyway. Um, so let's let's mix this green I'm also going to use my my larger brush again just so I can have a big mix of it well um, actually no I don't want my biggest brush let's go something smaller because so okay we one thing with impressionism from this point forward is we kind of want to try to be almost mixing every brush stroke as we go so that there is a as much variety in every single brush stroke as possible so rather than 
you know, some other types of art where you might mix like a whole big batch of one color and then use it in a whole bunch of different places. Impressionism is, you know, if you think about people painting outside, you're literally looking at something and the light could be changing from minute to minute. And so it wouldn't make sense to mix a whole bunch of one color. Oh, I, see, I like the leaf, that one particular area of leaves on that tree. I'm going to make a whole big batch of that one color. And then you go to, you know, oh, it's totally changed. Now the sun is in front. Okay, I got to make it. So that wouldn't make sense. You're kind of quickly mixing a color, painting it as where you think it goes. So we don't want to make, so we ideally we're, we're going back and mixing each time we're put, putting more paint on and doing another thing, which is to paint um, or mix colors directly onto the canvas. Okay, so let's get our warm yellow. This brush a little bit stiff here. Maybe I didn't clean it properly last time. Let me see. I'm just going to get some water on that brush to soften it up a bit. I think I'm going to go for something a little bit different. I'm going to switch brushes from this one, which I think is just a little bit too stiff, to this one is much softer. Because I want to be have this kind of quick brushy kind of feeling. So I'm going to take here some warm yellow and some cool blue and mix that. Now, whoa, that is, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, I think it's cool, but it's cool, like in terms of its color temperature, because there's so much of that blue in there. So I'm just going to add more yellow to it just to kind of tone, or not tone it down, desaturate some of that intensity of that color a little bit. So that's a little bit closer to the original. The other thing that we're going to add is a little bit of white in here. And white, unlike black, Impressionists used a lot of white in their painting. Now here we are. Now we're much closer to, to that. And so just kind of going forward, basically for all the green in this painting, I'm mostly just going to use a combination of the warm yellow and the cool blue and a little bit of white. Right? As I go, I can add a little bit more of the yellow, a little bit more blue, a little bit more white, etc. But we're really just using these two colors with a little bit of white. Okay, so now, um, oh, you know what? I was going to show. You know what? I think I could still do this with this paint here. Because, so let's say if, if this is, yeah, I'm going to take a quick little side detour here. My apologies. And I'm going to show you uh, what I would imagine she would have done working like to, to so she would have probably started with a, 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 a brown canvas that's been primed like this without any pencil marks on it. And then she would have started painting some outlines really quickly. And the way that she probably would have done that would be, again, to mix another brown. So I probably should have done this before. But let's do this here. I'm going to take some warm red and warm yellow, mix this together, and some blue. So this is a, a much more reddish brown. The main idea is that it's it's going to kind of stick off, stick out from the background. Okay, so she's got this color on her brush. You could, uh, I wouldn't even add any white, to, or I wouldn't add any white. I wouldn't any, add any water to it. My apologies. So, what she would do, and again, you you can imagine these pencil marks aren't there, but this is will help any of those of you that might have a little bit of trouble. So what she would do is she would probably go something like this, like very quick brush strokes, kind of outlining where this vase is. 
and then she'd say, okay, here's there's a flower here. Here's the center of this flower. Here we got another one here. We got like a little leaf up here. Okay, we got another flower here. Here's some petals. And then we've got a bunch of kind of brown foliage here. And then here's some other leaves. All right, so. So this is probably how she would have begun her painting, right? So she would have just taken a, a canvas that was, um, that had some brown on there to begin with, taking a little bit of brown with her brush, a little bit darker color, possibly, you know, even a little bit more blue in there, but this works really well. And then just very quickly done some very simple outlines. So you could, so this is why, you know, when I said you could jump two minutes ahead and now we're like 30 minutes ahead from where I was saying, but this is what you could have done if you wanted to just go right in and attack the painting like that, this would have been how you would do it. Now, I, I, that's, again, that might be a little bit scary for some of you out there. That's why I, I drew it in pencil first, because, you know, the idea is you can, you can have a lot of free, like freedom this way. And if you paint something in the wrong place, it's okay because it's, you're going to paint over all of it anyway. But I, again, I can understand why that would be you know, a little bit stressful, and then I'd see in the comments, I don't know, I think I'm going to sit this today's episode out after all, and just watch, right? So, um, and then also once this is painted, you don't really have to wait for it to, this uh, initial outline, you don't have to wait for it to dry, you can just kind of attack it. Okay, so we've mixed our paint here, this green, and again, we're going to be going back back and forth in here. In fact, maybe I'm going to, as I, I'm going to zoom out. Oops. So that you can kind of see the, the how I'm going to approach this here. So I've got my paint here, and let's go to the original. So we've got these very loosely defined things, and I'm just going to start going in here with this paint. And right, like, 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 it's giving it an impression of where some of these things go. All right, so and I'm gonna go in here. Let's get mix a little bit more paint, slightly different color. Let's put this in here. Right, there's, so this is there's a bit of a bulge in the in the vase here, so you can see how she's sort of kind of got these curving lines right in here. You can see some of the paint that comes off my brush might be a little bit of a different color than the color I originally picked up on here. Okay, so I'm just going to add a little bit more, slightly darker here. Okay, let's get a little bit more of this blue on my brush. The other thing too, you may notice, I'm holding the brush fairly far away from the tip. There's been other times where I've been painting like this, right, that it's almost like I'm writing or signing a check. When I'm painting impressionist paintings, I'm like all the way back. Right, so I'm kind of, which helps you get some more of this looseness in the brush. Okay. 
Okay. Another big thing is we want to try to... We really want to keep this background... We want some of this to come through. So it's it takes a little bit of restraint not to just fill the whole thing in with paint, right? Okay. Um, at this point, I'm also going to add a little bit of the warm blue to it. So I'm taking some of this warm blue... Let's put some in here. Okay. So, I'm going to... Um, that, that's a really good start on the green. Now, I'm not going to fully paint all of the green in at this stage. I'm just going to... I've got a, I've got a good start on it, but I'm going to now move to the, to the pink and the red and the white now, and then come back. So there's going to be this back and forth, back and forth. Okay. If I was painting an oil paint, I would just leave this paintbrush out on the table because it could take weeks for it to dry anyway. So, but with this acrylic paint, it could be dry in a matter of minutes and I don't want to ruin my brush, right? So I'm just going to set that aside and I'll think, okay, that's going to be my green. Um, do I have another brush like that? Okay, so I don't actually have another brush like that, so I'm just going to keep on using it. This is one of these square brushes. I don't know if I can... Right, so as opposed to like a round brush. So let's just show the difference here. Right, so this here on the left is the round brush. The one on the right is the square brush, right? Um, I personally, I, I generally use these round brushes anyway all the time. So let's mix the flowers now. I'm looking at uh, these colors here. So it looks to me there's it, it that that flower has there's I can see a couple of places. I, there's this red here. I feel like is might be a little bit of a combination between warm and cool red. Well, we'll see. Like, I, cause I see some of this in here, this purple. Um, but let's start out. We're gonna start out with a warm red and some white. So I'm gonna take this warm red. Let's put it right here in the center. Add just a tiny bit of white to my brush to start out with. And then let's go in here and start painting here. Right, so a couple of like these like fleeting brush strokes. And and you know, we're painting roses which have this sort of like tornado kind of quality, right? Everything's kind of spinning around a center axis. Okay. Now let's take more white here. So I'm adding a lot more white to this color. And you can see I'm not focusing on doing a little bit. I'm moving around. Okay, let's add a little more white to it. You can see I'm slowly adding more and more white onto my brush. And it's okay, like right there, that's maybe a, a bit of a jump forward, but it's going to get 
as it mixes with some of this paint that's already on the canvas, it's going to get, uh, um, it's going to lose some of that, the intensity of that white. You know, see by the time I get down here, it's, there's very little of it left on there. And then I can come back up and just soak a bit of that up. Um, okay, let's keep on going. More white on this brush. Okay, so that's pretty good for that part so far. I think what I'm going to do is actually wash my brush and then get these whites of this petal because there's not very much red on those, so let's just quickly wash the brush off. It doesn't have to be fully, fully, fully clean, but It'll certainly help. Okay, so now I've just got pure white on my brush. And I'm just going to paint some of this in here. Um, where else needs some white? Come into the vase and add some white into here. Again, you know, I'm being I'm these very quick little brush strokes. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about that so far. So I might need a little bit more. Okay. So, you know, depending on the way you feel, you could be pretty satisfied with this painting already. You know, if you look at it, you might feel like, you know what, I don't know, I think I might be kind of done. So that would be kind of up to you to, to make that judgment as you make these paintings. But you could see already very quickly, like, if we had just started this with a, um, a red or a, a brown primed canvas and just did some quick painting, really the amount of, of actual work we put into this painting is maybe 20 minutes. And here we are. And you could, you could call it a day right now if you wanted. I'm gonna go take this a little bit further and I'm gonna add a little bit into the background, but um, you know, we're, 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 you're, you're pretty, we're, we're near there, right? Because th part of the, Im the idea of the Impressionists is, is not going overboard and having some restraint, right? Which is, that's, re it's really, really hard not to just want to like really go in and fill the whole thing up, right? So let's go back to some of the greens, I think. Is that what I want to do next? Actually, you know what? I think at this point, I'm going to go in and do the, the background and bring a little bit of, of paint into the backgrounds and darken it down just a bit. So what I want is we're going to do another wash over top of the first wash. And this one's going to be a little bit darker, kind of a little bit of a dirtier color. And this time I'm going to make uh, it's going to be a cooler color. Right, which is not necessarily what she did in her painting, if I'm looking at this. Um, but I want to kind of reinforce some of the lessons from our course in here. So let's make a cool brown. So where's my... So how do, how do we make a cool brown? 
So one of the ways that we've made a warm brown so far is we've t mixed an orange with a warm yellow and a warm, so a warm yellow and a warm red, and we've got something around here. And then we went right across the neutral core and got some of this warm blue, right? So we took a color that was very saturated, right, on the outside of the color wheel, this nice bright orange, but then we mixed its complementary color on the opposite side of the color wheel, which gives us a brown, right? And, and also kind of a, neutralizes the color a little bit, its intensity, which is a good thing. You want actually the more uh, neutral colors in your painting helps make these like bright colors just sing. They boom, they pop, right? So how do we instead make a cool brown? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these cool colors. So we're gonna mix a cool green using cool yellow cool blue sorry we get one of these cool greens and then we're going to add some cool red to it so we're going to again same sort of thing we mix this color and then we mix its complement on the other side the color that complements it it's complementary color All right okay so and i think i'm also going to go back to my was this the did i use the, my big brush for this i think i did so I'm going to use that same big brush. So let's start out by mixing a green. I think that let's start out with got this here. Some of this yellow. We're not going to need much blue because you're going to you'll see how quickly that changes color. Boom! We got what a beautiful, nice saturated lime color. And then we're going to take some cool red, right? And mix this here. So ob instantly we had this really nice, gorgeous color. And all of a sudden it's now got this muddy kind of dying grass, like, you know, fall in the prairies kind of color, right? or you know or the winter in the prairies before the snow comes down it's got this you know it, it looks like grass that's dying right which is not surprising because we're we've got you know this color now exists somewhere we had this color and we mix it with this color it's now somewhere right around here and so it's very similar to the colors that we mixed before but it's built using cool colors so now this is a little bit too green. Although, actually, you know what? I don't mind it. I'm just looking at the original here. I think I'm going to use this <clears throat> a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some water on my brush. Let me just show you. Sorry. So I'm going to get some water on my brush. Right? Just very little water. There's enough on there, so I'm just diluting this a bit. So this is going to make it more transparent. Now, one thing I have to think about is before, if I start painting this in and then I really scrub it around, it's going to scrub this color. Remember like when I had those drips of water and I tried wiping them away with my finger? That's going to, same thing's going to happen with this brush, like as if I'm cleaning a pot in the sink if I start scrubbing it around. So I'm gonna paint it, but I'm gonna be very careful to do it quickly so I'm not lingering around on here. Okay, so let's start adding some of this color here. And I don't have to put it everywhere either. There can be places where there isn't any of this color. So the effect is pretty subtle, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a little bit of r more red to there. Right, the same kind of mixture. Oops, that's that's pretty blue, but you know, let's go we'll go with that. That's cool. Okay. Again, some water 
on my brush. This one's much darker, so I'm going to look for areas in the painting that were darker. You see how I'm kind of spreading the love around here and not keeping it all in one place? I, and I'm just kind of randomly putting these things in here. I'm not really looking at his painting, or sorry, her painting, too closely. I'm just, where do I think it needs it? I, actually, I'm looking at hers, and it is much darker right here. So I can go in here, darken that up. Again, I'm being very careful because now I've got... I've been there's a few layers of this same color right there and I don't want to overdo it otherwise I'm going to start scraping that underpainting out of the way. Um okay. Do I want to go any darker? I could go just a tad bit darker. So I'm just mixing a little bit more blue in here. And I'm not even going to put any water on there. Now I'm just going to, because there's a lot of water on here already, let's just put some of that in a few different places. So you can see a few places where I'm, I'm starting to scrub some of that paint up. So that means th this canvas is very wet and I'm going to start tearing my, my hair out in a couple seconds if I do too much more there. Okay, oh, let's, I haven't done anything down here. There's a little bit of a shadow down there because it looks sort of like the light is coming from the left because we've got some of these highlights there. It's a little ambiguous where the light is, but I think we do need a bit of a shadow there. So let's... Add a little more cool, sorry, cool blue in here. I'm just gonna add just a little bit of warm blue in there too. So that's gonna make a much darker color. And then let's it's maybe a little darker than hers for sure, but. Since I've got this color on my brush right now, I'm just going to use it in a few different places here. Okay. Now, I could continue doing this for a while. You can, you kind of get the idea, right? But I think I, I personally don't want it to get too dark. I like some of these areas that, that I can still see through. And so I'm not going to push my luck too much further here. But you could certainly make it much, much darker than I've done. So I'm going to wash my brush here. <laughs> Donna says that uh, um, dead grass color is what Alberta looks like right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was born and raised in Calgary, so I... I, I uh, um, I know that color of the, the grass very, very well. Okay. So, again, it's you might look at your, at your painting and feel like it's pretty close to being done right now. I, it's, uh, who knows? <laughs> um, I, I would say that I look at this painting and I do feel pretty close to being done. I do think I want to add a little bit more white into the row. Let's look at the original. A little bit more white into the rows here. This looks a little unfinished here. Um, 
these leaves look a little unfinished. So there's little tiny details that I think still need to be done, but uh, I think we're, we're pretty close. Okay. So now I'm going to put, make another warm, warm green with maybe a little bit more uh, yellow in it for these flowers. Because if we look at this here, these flowers need a little bit more warm yellow. So let's take, oh, you can see that paint has already started to dry a bit. So I'm going to take this color here. Let's try some warm yellow. All right, again, it's got a little bit of a grassy quality. And my paintbrush right now has, it's, it's not one consistent kind of, paint. It's going to change as I start painting on here, which I want. I want a little bit of uh, the paint to uh, um, not be just so definite. All right, so I'm just sort of softening that area up here. Let's get, so let's turn this right here. The other, th the other trick of like impressionism is often when we get close to the end of a painting, things start slowing down quite a lot. And we start kind of um, doing very, these little tiny details. Part of impressionism is, is still, even though you're close to being done, keeping up that, the kind of the, the quick brush strokes. I'm actually going to add a little bit of w warm red to this because that color is sort of just disappearing in there. So I want to make it a little bit more orangey. There we go. So you see how sort of like these flowers are kind of evaporating into the background a little bit. Right, there's sort of like a confusion as to where things begin and end. I'm going to take this same color. Let's add more blue to it. So this might be the darkest color we, we use in the entire painting. So I just took that orange and it's like a, it was a brown now.
Okay, so that's pretty good. Pretty happy with that. Now I'm going to take the same color that I have and just add a little bit of white to it because I'm going to go into... So it's adding just that color and going in with the white. I start getting kind of a bit of a gray paint. Right, I'm going to take this gray paint and go into some of these areas of the flower. And even into the flower itself. Oh, I just noticed I missed this. Not too many of them, because it's a, quite a kind of a dead color. But I'm just... You can see I'm kind of taking that same color and moving it around in a few different places so that it's um, fully integrated into the picture. It's not just all by itself in a few different little places. Let's get a little bit, I'm going to take the same color and rub it in here where I've got some of these greens. Let's get some green on that color. I think I'm going to darken, put a little bit of darker color right here. I'm feeling pretty good about, like, um, like I'm feeling closer to being pretty, to being done here. I'm going to go, I want this uh, brown background again. So, um, I'm just going to quickly take my brush. Let's mix a little bit more of this brown. So the cool yellow, cool blue, and some cool red together here. Very dark. Add a little bit of water to it. And let's just Darken in here. Uh, a little different than what she did, of course, but uh, to be expected. That's why her paintings sell for ten million dollars a pop, right? She's a master. She's a master at it, right? Deborah says, I almost think we should squint and paint. That, you know, that's definitely one thing, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but that's actually probably what they would have been doing, especially when you're painting outdoors, is the act of squinting, you know, closing your eyes and pretending like, almost like you're trying to sleep or, you know, and what it does is it gets rid of all the details and it, it helps you see contrast a little bit Right, so you can start seeing the 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 primary shapes in there, where the, the highlights and the shadows are. Okay, so I think I'm almost done here. I'm gonna wash. I got these all these dirty brushes, which is needs to be cleaned, and taken care of right now. Okay, I'm gonna wash those again a little bit better later on after we're done but uh let's just final little touches are going to be in the flower with a little bit of just white and i'm just going to add not pure 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 white a little bit of actually you know what this time we're going to add a little bit of cool 
red in here. A slightly different color, a little bit more rose kind of a color. And let's go into here. So again, we want to show some restraint here. So you got to be, especially when we're right near the end, I think I actually need a little bit more red back in here. I put a little, I, just, I need to just darken this flower just a smidge. Let me see, there's a couple of, before I do that, just a couple of quick. Uh, maybe there should have been a little more yellow in those areas, but um, yeah, let's get. I'm gonna take a little bit of this, the rose red. Let's just see. Oh, that might be a little bit too pink. So I'm gonna mix that with just some warm red in here. You can see I'm also these kind of curving strokes too. Uh, let's go down in here, make this a little bit darker. Might even make this just a little bit more on the brown side, that red. So taking some blue, going in here, a little bit more purpley quality, just as it is in the shadow here. same purple in a few different places where we'd expect them to be in the shadow just to so that color isn't all by itself yikes that was a little darker than I was expecting Okay, I don't think it's going to get any better if I keep working on it. I think I'm going to um, say that that is maybe good enough. Right? Is it exactly like hers? No. Do, can I feel happy with this painting? Yes. And that's what I'm, I'm after. Right? I think what's nice about what we've done here is is we've uh, we've got many of the same sort of qualities that make her painting such a beautiful painting there's we can see the there's the very the, the way that we've treated the background there's kind of this slightly dirty kind of color that, that we've sort of brushed over top of the background so kind of creating a little bit of confusion for people as to what how it was made which is a good thing um, we've got some of these highlights in the flowers um, 
you know, I, I, I prefer the way that she did hers over mine. What is this little mark? That's weird. It's going to drive me crazy when I look at it. Later. Just want to sometimes, it's one of those things that you don't see until later. It's just touching that up. Okay. Now I can live with it. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy with the way this turned out. Uh, you know, painting impressions, paintings aren't, aren't super easy. It's a, it's kind of a little bit tricky, but I think, you know, we've managed to do, oops, let's back up just a bit. Capture kind of the essence, the impression, if you will, of uh, Berta Marceau's um, roses here. Um, let me see. Palash says, yeah, I like that idea. It helps. Thank you. I think we're talking about when we're squinting our eyes and that helping to kind of see the light and darks. Good to see you again, Palash. Um, Deborah says, wow, Michael, you are amazing. You can do a painting in just a little over two hours. That is my goal to be able to finish a painting with you. Um, painting the time allotted for your class. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say, Deborah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I deliberately chose this of all of the paintings that uh, Marceau has painted because it's on the simpler end of things. With, you know, certainly she did a lot of portraits of people and landscapes, and a lot of those are pretty complicated. Like she, she was, you know, one of the great artists of, of our time. And um, so those would have been way too complicated for us. Having said that, in a few weeks, or maybe it's this time next week, I can't remember the exact schedule, we are going to be painting. Um, let me just take a look at the upcoming uh, shows. Oh, that's, I'm glad that we're doing it. Okay, so in, in two weeks' time, we're going to be painting a Renoir painting. So one of her friends, uh, they were obviously he made portraits of her and they probably painted alongside one another a few times so we'll do a Renoir painting and I think this will have been a really good introduction for people to paint the Renoir because you'll we'll use some of these same painting techniques a little bit later on um, on Thursday in just a couple of days we're gonna be painting a Banksy painting and I'm gonna show you guys a few different ways to do the Banksy painting I'm going to put up on uh, the, the, the Facebook and on YouTube a link to download the template for if you want to print it off because we're going to do a f we're going to paint that painting in a few different ways. We're going to, I'm going to show you just like with the Warhol painting, how to just paint it just straight out of, you know, you know, we'll draw it out and then we'll paint it. But I'm also going to give you the opportunity if you want to print out a copy of the image and then use that for a photo transfer. And we're gonna also make a stencil next class. So if you have, um, I'm tied in, but just, do I have any within? Yes, okay, I think I got this. Can I reach this? So for next class, if you want to just get some poster board, this is literally the poster board from the dollar store, right? You get uh, two of these for a dollar here, right? You can see there's the, the price tag on there. So if you wanna grab one of these, it'll be helpful to make a stencil next week. If you have like an X-Acto knife or a razor blade, um, you know, you can, you can use a big thing of box cutters. Let me just move this out of the way while we're talking. So you could use like box cutter, or I have a whole bunch of blades around here now. Why can't I find them? Um, oh, I think I put it in with my... So I'll just lay out... Sorry, my head is in the way of the screen. Oh, I know I have more of them, but anyway. These kind of things... Right. Here's, here's all my different cutting tools. Uh, all, some of these I haven't seen in years. Anyway, so if you have something like 
this for doing any kind of cutting. That would be ideal. But if you have, um, it would be hard to do with scissors, but you could probably get away with it. But anyway, I'll, there'll be links for those images I'll put up in the next uh, 24 hours. And you can download those if you want, or you can just sort of watch and kind of gather the, the, the process from there. I'm gonna sign this here, just making sure it's not upside down. Oh my goodness, it's December. Berthe Morisot. And just like that, another painting to add to our stack of paintings. If you found this one a little bit tricky, this might be a good one to try doing a second time. Because part of, as I said, part of the making of this painting is showing a little bit of restraint. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that people look at and like, my kid could do that. But I think as, you'll, as you may have experienced while you're trying to make this painting, it's deceptively a little bit tricky, right? To especially to have that restraint and not fill up all the background because part of the, the beauty of the painting is how we see so much of that original warm color coming through and it gives it this warm glowing quality, which is a big part of the, how the Impressionist painted is they wanted the paintings to glow and just feel like they were full of energy and light. Okay, so um, maybe just before I go here, just looking, whoa, uh, lots of comments. Um, Donna says, that's living room worthy. <laughs> yeah, so this, yeah, it's, this one, this one's one I wouldn't mind, I could have up on the wall and I'd be very proud of. And I'm sure you guys as well, I'm sure many of you guys have created something that looks fantastic. And it's a great reminder that I would love to see those. And I'd love to talk about the great work that you guys have made. The next session where we talk about all of your work won't be for another month. I think actually, if I look at the schedule, uh, oops, I don't have it there. I think it's the next time we, we have a session where I give you feedback on your work is December 28th, I think. So between Christmas and New Year's, there's a little, um, we'll have a, a day where you you can just sit back, pour yourself a, a rum and eggnog and kick up your feet and I'll go through all the great art that you guys have made over the past, from, from now all the way until um, Christmas basically. And I've got some cool Christmas paintings that I have in mind for, for that part of the year. Uh, so next week we've got our, our next class is Banksy, then Betty Goodwin, a great, great Canadian painter, Marc Chagall, Renoir, and Bridget Riley. So we'll also learn how to do s using some tape and hard edge painting, which is, it's a deceptively simple painting, but I think the techniques that we'll learn on that one will also be really helpful going forward. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Oh, I saw uh, Donna has generously donated to the show there. Thank you for using the super chat. I'm glad that that function's working again. Um, so you can donate via, there's a little, depending if you've given your your credit card to Google, you'll be able to see a little uh, uh, dollar sign logo where you can enter comments and you can donate via that way. There's also a link to my PayPal in the description below. And if you'd like to do any other kind of <laughs> transfer of money, you can send me a message through Facebook and I'll give you my email to do that. Peter says, last class you mixed a warm blue and a cool blue. Can you talk about what you're looking for when you're mixing a warm and cool of the same color? Okay, um, good question. Where's my, um, let's do that. So the, 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 one of the reasons you'd mix a color side by side here 
like these two blues, is you're going to get a darker color, first of all, because of the, there's, in here, they're kind of splitting off in different directions. So this color has some red in it and orange, and this color's got some yellow and green in it, right? So this that's why this one is cooler, and this, why, this one's warmer. So when they're mixing together, they're going to get darker. They're going to lose some of their intensity. Um, but this is a, a good color if you wanted to outline things. You want to get, if you want to get close to a black, what I would normally do is, is make a brown, just like we did here, and then add w another one of the blues in there, and that's going to help make it a really nice dark color. You could do the same thing with what we did here when we mixed these, uh, the cool in the blue, cool yellow and cool blue, and the cool red, and then you add a little bit more warm blue to the mixture uh, would get you a nice also dark color that way you just one would be a little bit warmer and one would be a little bit cooler um, yeah and I also did I had a little bit of warm red and cool red that I put into the flower today uh, it's it's part of it is is trying to just bridge a little bit of this gap and get closer to the so-called primary color that would exist between um, these two. Um, it's it's sort of it, it's because I guess part of the thing is it's also trying to prevent that color from going in either direction. It's sort of like uh, taking two because these colors want to go away from one another. So by putting them together, you're sort of like canceling out the warm quality and the cool like they kind of they're so they're in this it's like two magnets that are you know they're so there's a bit of a tension there and so you're you're well, how would you describe that like you're uh canceling out its color temperature and neutralizing it in some way that would be the way i would think about it same sort of thing if you mixed any of these other ones together that's a good question i, I mean i haven't uh, thought about it. part of part of me teaching these classes is it forces me to express things that are in my head that I've been doing for 20 years or plus painting and I just it just comes naturally to me because of like a, a habit or instinct and so that's a great question Peter it makes me like okay how do I explain like what am I doing here <laughs> how do I explain that whole thinking thought process uh, Deborah says, yes, I cannot paint Irene because I want to pay attention to his comments. I will do this tomorrow when I can pause the video and work at my own pace. And Heidi says, I'm trying to post your my picture right now. So that's uh, that's awesome. If you finish your painting, it's a really good idea to take a photograph of it, and then you can send it to me now. And that just makes it, when I'm putting the show together in December, or the, the, the feedback on your work for December, a little bit it goes a little bit faster because if I have if your paint if you're sending your paintings all um, you know as you make them it uh, probably makes it also easier for you as well anyway thank you so much everybody for making another painting with me today and this is we've been going doing some longer painting sessions lately my apologies for going two three four hours at times um, so today's, this is the shortest one we've had in a while. I kind of don't even know what to do with myself now. Um, so thank you again for joining me. We'll see you in a couple of days. Uh, subscribe to the Facebook. Uh, so the link is below there so you can get the template for the Banksy we're going to do in a couple of days. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening, your morning, uh, breakfast, dinner. I'm going to go have some food, some dinner myself, and we'll see you. Uh, in a couple of days. Bye-bye, everybody.